Hey, what's up everybody? This is Titan, Titans of CNC. And uh, we're gonna talk about the steps to building a hundred million dollar company. And I, I just got an email and I wanted to share this email with you, all right? So, Parker Aerospace. I am seeking to do some resourcing of our parts rather than outsourcing outside the U.S. I'm in hopes that your company might be able to help us with this effort, the supply chain manager for Parker Aerospace. You guys know Parker, they're massive. Their parts are pretty much on every single airplane, private, and military all over the world. Now, Parker is just one company, okay? We actually get contacted all the time with companies trying to give us work, trying to figure out how to solve their sourcing problems, right? Why did they contact us? Because we're probably one of the most visible shops in the world. We have the only national TV show on American Manufacturing. We have a massive CAD, CAM, and CNC Academy that we put out that is now servicing 170 countries. And our social platforms have basically exploded, right? So people know us and they know that we're fighting for manufacturing. Therefore, they come to us with their problems, all right? And because of my experience, working with many multi-billion dollar companies and sitting in the meetings with top aerospace companies and hearing on a daily basis what their problems are. And not just aerospace, but massive computer companies that would love to reshore, but they just don't know how. There's a video that went viral. Tim Cook from Apple was basically saying, hey, we have so much manufacturing that there's no way that it can be done in the United States. It has to be done in China, right? Because they're able to handle our volume. In that, he talked about having a massive room and he could not fill it with engineers in this country, all right? So he's basically saying, I have to take all of our stuff over here because that's where production happens. Now, when I look through the comments, I saw everybody saying, oh, we have a million engineers and engineers and engineers and stuff. And absolutely, we manufacture on a huge level. But there is some truth to what he's saying, right? If you go to Lockheed, you're going to have a million engineers, right? And they're making crazy parts. If you go to Northrop, you're going to have a million engineers and they're making crazy parts, but it's their parts, right? If you go to SpaceX and Blue Origin and you go to all these different companies, they basically have built amazing companies. They have engineers on staff working on their products. But if you actually look into production facilities that have open capacity to actually take on massive volume, then we do have a deficit. I don't want to get all over the place, so let me be kind of pinpoint accurate. Now, if you look at job shops, let's, let's say job shops with 25 or less employees. There's a million of them out there, and they actually do an amazing amount of work. They specialize in all industries, all materials, they can turn on a dime and they make it happen every day. But in manufacturing, there's levels or tiers. So when you look at shops with 25 or less employees or even 50 employees or less, there's a massive amount of competition, all right? But when you go to the top tier, the higher tier of production job shops that can handle a massive amount of work that has open capacity right now to actually take on the work, then the competition is much smaller, right? Because those who figured out the secret sauce are incredibly busy and those that haven't have probably gone out of business or gotten smaller. All right, there's definitely some exceptions, but when Parker comes to me and says, hey, we have all this work and it's massive, I honestly don't know where to turn. Let me just say something real quick. If you are an amazing company and you have a lot of employees and a lot of open space and you have expertise, talent, quality, and you deliver on time, 
Put your information down in the comments because we're followed not only by the industry, but by a lot of top level buyers, right? Purchasers of parts. So put your information down there, all right? And if you haven't subscribed, here's the, another plug. Hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, boom. So there you have it. This is the reason why we're doing this video, all right? I came in this morning and I actually started writing some notes and I'm like, you know what? This is actually so big. And it's so good that there's no way that I can actually do it justice in one video. So I'm going to try to keep this video semi short and then maybe just turn it into a series to teach high level stuff. Like how do you actually take a company to the next level? How do you actually get that work and how do you maintain that consistent success and just keep walking up? All right, and that's the stuff that we're gonna talk about, the step-by-step -step strategy to make it happen, all right? So one of the first steps I would say is, is understanding the opportunity in the market. What's the timing? It's all about timing, all right? So the two things that I see right now is aerospace is blowing up and production machining, there is a huge need in production machining, right? A lot of people talk about automation and robots and they're killing jobs, no. No, that's not the case. Companies can rise up because of automation now and actually bring in this work and actually be incredibly efficient and productive and pay their people well because they program robots. And you can have one person running many machines, but if you didn't have that technology, that company wouldn't exist. So we can have more companies because of it. And that's production machining, okay? now. The first thing I mentioned was aerospace. Why is aerospace such a huge opportunity? Because as a machining culture, we simply are not good at it yet, all right? You have great machinists that work for Boeing and great machinists that work in-house at, at SpaceX and, and Northrop and Lockheed and stuff. But when it comes to shops on the outside, many are slammed because Boeing and other companies are busy and they've been a vendor for years for those companies, right? But the new rocket companies like Blue and SpaceX and these companies, they can only build their products if they have the right vendor base. And the truth of it is 20 years ago, we didn't have private aerospace companies. So people who are coming in to actually do this work, they're new to it and many are falling on a daily basis, right? Because they just don't have the experience to hit those tolerances to deliver on time when dealing with complicated materials. So there's a huge opportunity in it. And you would think that people were just attacking these opportunities, right? But it's difficult because to take advantage of each opportunity, aerospace and production machining, you have to have a good head for advanced education, right? Because we're dealing with new things. Now I keep bouncing between the aerospace and the production machining, but in an essence across industries, they're almost the same thing, right? We look at aerospace and aerospace is an $800 billion industry that will be a two to $3 trillion industry within 10 years. We know how to build rockets. Like we understand the technology. Now it's just about efficiency and getting faster at making the parts and bringing the money down so more companies can just keep rising. Production machining is basically machining everything, but having a mind to actually bring the cost down through automation, okay? So when you solve the problems in both, you have a chance at being incredibly successful. So I discussed the opportunity. Let's talk about the importance of having a good plan, okay? You gotta have a good plan. When I started my company, I started with a loan. A lot of you guys know the story already, right? I started with a loan for $125,000. I actually went out and actually decided to buy four machines. I got two VF2 SS's and I got two Lay's. I looked at the machines and I understood exactly what I needed to do with those machines to be successful. All right, four machines and I needed to run them all day and all night. I got a space, it was about 4,000 square feet. I created fixturing 
for my customers that allowed me to run longer and to run more parts. I put the time into the fixturing, to the automation, so that I could actually use that as a selling point to my customer that one person, myself, could actually run four machines because I had an hour runtime here, hour runtime here, I had a bar feeder here, and I was chucking over here. So instantly I'm selling that. Why I can be cheaper and better and more efficient than somebody else. Now I also had a philosophy and I understood that the philosophy was scalable, all right? So I looked at my four machines and I knew that other shops for the same amount of work were charging $75 to $125 per hour. And I thought to myself, okay, I need to undercut those numbers, okay? I need to be aggressive. So I'm gonna go at $60 an hour. Some people say, well, you went at $60 an hour, how can you actually make a living off of $60 an hour? Well, it was only me, my wife, Jeff and this kid Jordan that actually worked at the company when we started. And in that came the master plan to run minimum 116 hours per week. Now, if you calculate it, if you had four machines times $60 per hour, it equals $240 per hour. You times that by 116 and it gives you $27,840 per week. That's just labor. Now, times that by 52 weeks, and then divide it by 12 months, and you come out with $120,000 per month with just four machines. So there's the philosophy, have enough machines and actually run them day and night. And we were successful. You know, did we make $120,000 the first month? No, we made, I believe, $11,000. But the next month we got like 33,000, then we got 43,000, then like 52,000 and then 60. And we kept going up and up and up until within four years we were at a million per month and we made it happen, right? We scaled, we went from four machines to six machines, to eight machines, to 12 machines, to 20 machines. And we kept the same philosophy, run 116 hours per week with an understanding that the first shift actually pays for the building, it pays for the electrical, it pays for the office, right? The second shift is where you're actually making your money. And then when you have your weekend shift, again, that is profit right there. Now, you can say, again, to Titan, you're only charging $60 an hour, but I had one guy running three machines, one guy running four machines, right? And if I had charged $100 or $125 and half my machines were sitting, it'd still be the same amount of money, right? And I would be in the pack. But instead, I've separated myself, I've marketed myself and my team that we can actually produce parts cheaper at a lower cost than anybody else. And it's not only the hourly amount that we charged, it was the expertise in building the part. And we can't discount the effect that your expertise has in your company and in your ability to compete, all right? So when other people were running at this time, we were running at this time, and for a portion of the price. Make sense? So we took efficiency in time and volume of work and volume of machines. We added it with an expertise in how we actually ran the machines, our aggressiveness. And then we added superior quality and our ability to deliver on time under budget at a reasonable price. And that's why we were able to have pick of the litter. Meaning there's all these machine shops, but people saw us as different and therefore they gave us the work that we wanted and we were able to choose the right type of work. And that in itself is very important, the right type of work. So you can't take everything that comes across your desk. You have to pick the right jobs that's gonna allow your company to run efficiently for extended periods of time that can give you consistent money coming into the company from the other side. Make sense? All right, so I've barely scratched the surface and the video is already going long. 
all right? There's some questions I'm sure that you're asking yourself. How do I get that email that Titan got, right? How do I get those first four machines? How do you actually take four machines and turn it into six machines, to eight machines, to 12 machines, to 20 machines, to 40 machines, right? Those are all questions that we're going to answer in great detail, but we're gonna have to do that in another video, all right? So let's do that. Let's just create this series right now. And if you have questions, ask me questions down there, all right? But make sure the questions are serious. Like, how do you actually build your company? Like, how do you get work? How do you like actually make it all happen and be successful so you can put food on your tables, take care of your employees, build your culture, and just take it to the next level? All right, I will leave you with this. Even if you're not big, if you want to be big, if you have grand visions, then you need to think big. Even when you have nothing, you have to draw that confidence. You have to think big and you have to start speaking it. Because when you start speaking it and you put action behind those words and you listen to the words that I'm speaking, you will be successful, not only in business, but in life. We're gonna go over all of it. All right, I will see you guys in the next video where we will continue on our journey in explaining exactly how to build a $100 million company for success.